know, all of our materials are available on download or available to download, um, including our uh, entire, uh, I just recently updated the uh, entire 2020, 2020 training presentation slides. Uh, you guys can have that in PDF format. We've got some training information, some interesting articles about batteries, maintenance stuff, uh, you know, maintenance logs, even some Excel, Excel spreadsheet stuff for tracking maintenance if you want. Um, that's all available on our role share drive to get there. All you got to do is go to HTTP uh, uh, forward slash forward slash tiny.cc forward slash roles shared drive. That'll take you right to my Google Drive directory. Uh, if you want me to send you the email link, I can send the email link. That's again at steve at And I'll give you a link to that and a link to our YouTube training site if you want that. Uh, here's my contact information. My name is Steve Higgins. I'm the technical services manager for roles. Uh, I've been in the solar business for 25 plus years, started back at Trace Engineering in the early or the mid 90s. Um, <clears throat> here's my contact information if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to give me a call if you have any questions uh, or you can send me an email. I'll be more than happy to do what I can to try to help you out. Um, something about the this training today, uh, you all should have a screen that looks like this. We're going to try to keep this to about 60 minutes. If we get more people and we get more people who have questions, uh, I will, I would, I would all plan on sticking around for however long people have questions for. Um, uh, everybody should have a screen like this uh, on their computer. Uh, a couple things, uh, a couple things that you want to look at is uh, if you're having trouble hearing with your computer audio. Um, uh, or you don't have a computer mic, it might be a good idea to get, give a give this phone number a call with your cell phone. Actually, it's probably not the same phone number. Uh, so you want to try to, you, this. I wouldn't use that specific phone number, but um, if you want to give that phone number a call or give that a, the, whatever number is listed on, our, on your screen a call and enter in the access code and uh, you'll be able to hear it, maybe you may be able to hear a little better. Uh, I have muted the microphones because the last thing we want is the echo. Uh, I was just running some testing before with my other computer and I got the infinite echo, which was kind of nice. Um, all right. All right, so, okay. So if you have a question, you can either type it in. Uh, if you see the, uh, oops, as I, as I, I'm having issues here. Ooh, that didn't work out. Ah, wonderful technical difficulties. That's what happens when I hit the escape key when I shouldn't. Let me get that back up. There we go. So I have muted everybody's microphone. Um, uh, what you want to do is you can either hit this button here. And what that will do is uh, that'll give you a, you hit this button right here and that'll that'll raise your hand. Uh, other thing that you could do is if you just type your question into the question box, those questions will pop up. I'll read the question and respond it to you. Just depends if you want to verbally give the question or, or not. If you raise your hand, I'll unmute your microphone so that you can do that, um, so, that uh, so that you can verbally uh, uh, ask the question. Uh, just let you know if you if I do unmute it, make sure that your mic and speaker are integrated, because otherwise, what you're going to do, what will happen is, is if you're talking on your phone and you have your computer volume up, what will happen is, is you'll get an echo and it'll reverb to the whole presentation, and it and it isn't pleasant. All right, so I don't see any questions yet. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, I am going to talk a little bit about battery maintenance to start with. Maybe we can free up some questions. We've got a few more folks that have come in. Um, so right now, this time of year, battery maintenance, we're in our spring maintenance. Plus there's a lot of folks that, uh, that, um, that frankly uh, are stuck at home with this wonderful COVID-19 situation we all have going on. Uh, speaking on that, I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's staying safe and taking care of yourself. I hope those, uh, folks who are considered uh, uh, necessary or emergency, emergency responders, I hope you're all taking care of yourselves. Um, speaking of taking care of yourselves, your number one priority when you're doing battery maintenance should be safety. 
whenever you're doing battery maintenance, it can be hurtful, especially if mistakes are made, like dropping spanners or wrenches. Or uh, just recently, I was in a battery bank room with 96 2KS 33s. The room was a relatively small room. And within about three minutes in the room, while the batteries are gassing, uh, uh, you would get, I would get blurry vision, headache, you know, typical uh, hydrogen sulfide poisoning, basically. You walk out, you know, out of the room, 10, 15 minutes later, everything goes away, you're fine. Uh, so it's a good idea to, to wear something. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, nowadays, most you can't find the N95 mask or the chemical mask because everybody has hoarded them. Um, but uh, at least put a face covering, weigh something over your eyes. Um, uh, so you want to be careful with that. You want to be cautious with that kind of stuff. Um, all charging should be shut down and open up all the doors and windows in the room while you're doing the battery maintenance. Um, uh, if you're doing battery maintenance, uh, make sure that you're make sure you're doing that and taking care of it. Um, uh, because if you're if you've got your doors and windows closed up and you've got lots of gas in there, you're going to have problems with breathing and you're going to have problems with headaches, blurry vision. Uh, you could also ignite that hydrogen. That's going to cause problems. So. Um, now it looks like you got a couple. That looks like we got a couple questions. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and but I'm going to go ahead and finish up with this this, this maintenance stuff, and then I'm going to answer at, at, uh, uh, answer these questions. Uh, let's see here. So basic tools you need. It's a good idea to have someone on site with you. Uh, it's very important. Uh, it's very important to have someone on site with you. Make sure you have gloves, safety glasses, uh, a mask to protect you from inhaling the hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, blows my mind how many people have had batteries for four or five or six years who don't have a hydrometer or a refractometer to check specific gravities. You have to have that kind of stuff. If you don't, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Um, distilled water. You have to have distilled water. Okay. Um, uh, if you don't have it, uh, you can use deionized or, uh, or uh, reverse osmosis water, but you have to test it to make sure that the water is proper water to be used. Um, I've got some pictures I'll show you a bit later what it looks like when you don't use the right water if we get there. Um, make sure that your wrench or your spanner, uh, make sure they're dipped or they're protected. So if you do drop them, they're not gonna short across the posts of the terminals. Um, some sort of post cleaner, uh, wire brush, fire or file or rasp. If you do have corrosion, make sure you clean the corrosion with the uh, clean it off. Get yourself some new lead. Make your new connections and then reconnect your connections. Uh, remember, corrosion is caused by three things. It's caused by overfilling the batteries. It's caused by poor ventilation and it's caused by loose connections. Um, so if you're seeing a lot of excessive corrosion, the corrosion is a maintenance issue. Uh, lastly, when you remake your connections, make sure you have a torque wrench so you're actually torquing the battery connections to the right connections. Uh, and then, of course, baking soda is important to have. Uh, if you if you do have a corrosion issue or a ventilation issue, put some sort of dielectric grease or petroleum jelly on the batteries. And in hot locations, you can use a heat compound to try to dissipate some of the heat to the batteries. Um, make sure you have an eye wash kit. This is important to have. In case you make them, if you make a mistake, I always, if I do, when I do site evaluations or site surveys where I'm in the field myself, I have, uh, I have two eye wash kits that I have on my toolbox um, that I set, I set at the ready in case something bad happens. That way I can flush my eyes in case there's a problem. Now, technically you shouldn't need an eye wash kit if you're using the proper eye protection. So, um, uh, so it's important to make sure you, you, you approach the safety up, up front. Make sure you remove all jewelry, no necklaces, no rings, no watches, nothing metal on your hands, your neck. Um, last thing you'll want to do is drop your uh, uh, drop something across the across the battery post and cause it to arc. About three years ago, actually about two years ago now, I was I had just got my new glasses. I was uh, working on a battery bank. Of course, I wasn't wearing my eye protection over the top of my glasses. My glasses fell off. And they shorted across the post of the battery and blew the grasses frames. Um, that was not covered under warranty, so um, I had to pay another $200 to replace my frames and my glasses. So 
Um, make sure you make sure that everything's protected nowadays. Uh, put the little croquis to hold the glasses on your head. Then I make sure I put my eye protection over the top. Um, no open flames. Um, no smoking cigarettes. No open flames when you're when you're when you're doing maintenance on your battery. Because if you do, you're going to have problems. And then of course, a poly cost, uh, polyester cotton mixed clothing is best. Uh, it's also a good idea to have an acid resistant apron when you're doing work on batteries. Um, cotton gets eaten alive. If it's got a polyester mix, it survives the acid a bit more, a bit better than, than just standard cotton, cotton clothing. Um, flooded lead acid batteries, um, very important. Every 30 to 90 days, you are doing these things for your flooded lead acid batteries that you're measuring and recording your specific, your, 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 re your resting and your loaded voltages. This means rested, resting voltages means the voltages. It, it means the voltages that that um, that you're running without any load. So if you can shut the system down, put the system to bypass mode, um, it's very important to make sure the system is actually resting. Loaded, what you do is you do a full 100% charge, and then just to give it a, a good idea of what the of what the how the batteries are doing. Run a 500,000 watt load for a couple hours and see where the voltages, if the voltages or how the voltages drop. Generally, the voltages across all the batteries should drop at close to the same rate. So if you get, you know, one battery that's 6.4, one that's 6.3, one that's 6.2, one that's 6.4, one that's 6.3, that's great. That's awesome. I, I would accept that. I would accept up to about two to four tenths of a volt difference between the cells or between the batteries. Um, if you see, you know, five batteries at 6.4 or 6.2, and then you get one battery that drops all the way down to 5.4, you've definitely got a, you've definitely got an issue developing there. Okay. Um, check and record electrolyte levels. Um, go through, you know, I, I call it electrolyte. It's the, the water, it could be called water. It could be called battery acid. It's the, the liquid that's in the flooded lead acid battery. Uh, check it, record it, and then top it off. Um, especially after you finish the full charge. You don't want to top it off before you do an equalization or before you do a full charge. And you definitely do not want to overfill it, okay? Do not get the water level anywhere near a half inch to a quarter inch from the bottom of the tube that extends into the battery. If you do, you are going to be losing electrolyte, you're going to be losing sulfate, and you're going to lower your battery capacity. Um, check and record your specific gravity measurements. And it's important to make sure that you know what your specific gravity measurements are because as if you don't, you don't know if the batteries are actually getting charged. Charge controllers, inverters are all stupid, pardon the phrase, but they all do what you programmed them to do. So if they're programmed to charge the batteries incorrectly, they're going to charge the batteries incorrectly every time. Um, and then of course, adjust charging settings based upon what your specific gravity measurements return, which means if your specific gravities are all equal but low, that means you're undercharging your batteries and you need to raise your parameters. And so you bump up your parameters. If your specific gravities are above 1.275, you know, say they're 1.280, 1.290, that means you're overcharging the batteries and that you need to lower your charging settings. So uh, check your ambient temperatures, make sure they're not getting too hot. Uh, remember, batteries like to be at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. If they're not, then um, uh, if they're too cold, if they're colder, it's going to reduce capacity. If they're warmer, that's going to reduce overall life. Again, record cell temperatures while the batteries are charging um, make, to, to make sure the batteries aren't getting too hot. Um, inspect cell integrity. So visually inspect all the batteries to see if you've got any leaking bulging excessively bulging cases broken cases especially this time of year um, this time of year a lot of customers shut their cabins down they come back to the cottage and they realize that they forgot to turn the inverter off or they something happened to the charge controller or something happened and the batteries got cold and froze that happens um, typically it starts in February and I get call we get calls all the way through May or April uh, uh, or April or May talking about uh, frozen batteries. Um, inspect for corrosion at the terminals, uh, racks or cabinets, make sure you clean that up and get rid of it. 
Um, then of course, check battery uh, monitoring equipment to verify operation. And then of course, top off with distilled water as necessary. Um, about every 180 days, you wanna test your ventilation. You wanna make sure that your ventilation works. All flooded lead acid batteries must have an active ventil ventilation system according to code, CSA code, uh, ETL, UL code, uh, in a, or, uh, National Electric Code for the United States. All flooded lead acid batteries should have some sort of active ventilation. Most inspectors are gonna require that. Um, you know, check for high resistive connections about every 180 days. What that means is put your spanner on the connection, loosen it up and retorque it. Don't just tug on the wire because if the connection's already been welded, you're gonna have all kinds of problems eventually down the road. Uh, check for broken or frayed cables. Um, that site that I mentioned that I was at three weeks ago, uh, that site I asked three, that, that I mentioned three weeks ago, that specific site, uh, there was 96 batteries. There were probably 20 cables in that system that were degraded so poor, so badly that they needed to be replaced. You could actually, you, when you squeeze the cable, you can actually feel the, 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 the strands, you know, disintegrating as you squeeze the cable. It shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to squeeze it. You shouldn't be able to feel it give. Um, certified charge output, bulk, op, bulk absorption voltage settings of the charge controllers. So start the charge process. Look at the output of the charge controller. Look at where the batteries, make sure the voltage is, is the same that's on the output of the charge controller or the inverter, and it's the same at the batteries. Make sure you're not getting a lot of voltage drop. Um, again, inspect cells for cracks leaking and evidence of leakage, and then of course, check your grounding connections. Um, a lot of the same stuff applies for the absorbed glass mat batteries. Uh, you know, checking your voltage, adjusting your charging, recording ambient temperatures, inspect cell and temperatures. Um, a lot of this all is the same for, for absorbed glass or mat or gels. The only real difference is, is that absorbed glass mats or gels, about at once a year, you're gonna wanna do a load test on the system just to see what, what's going on with the batteries, just to make sure that you're doing it. And you know, I, I typically will suggest to people on new installations that they do a load test at six months just to make sure that they know that they're charging those batteries at the correct voltages and correct times. All right, so questions. Uh, I'm gonna answer some of these questions now. Or, so what we've got is, hi, Steve, I appreciate the chance. So by the way, this is from Rico. Rico and Natalie, I, hopefully I didn't murder your name. If I did, I apologize. Uh, I appreciate the chance to ask questions. As a customer, I don't always have exp uh, access to expertise. I'm reaching the end of life on my Sered S530s and I'm considering lithium or LifePo4 or lithium iron phosphate batteries. What are your thoughts and considerations? Um, so the lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, they're, a, they're a great option, uh, especially for smaller systems or a grid tie like a backup system or a grid uh, 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 tie system where you're selling off peak loads or where your customer or you specifically don't want to do hardly any maintenance at all. Uh, there is some maintenance that still comes with a lithium iron phosphate battery and that's just basically checking connections. Um, we do sell, and this is also going to uh, answer the question from Michael Barfoot as well. We do, matter of fact, in September of 2019, we released a lithium option of our own. Uh, it's available in a 24 volt or a 48 volt parallel stackable. You cannot series them. So you can't take two 24 volt modules and hook them up to 48 volts. You have to buy the 48 volt module. Um, but you can parallel up to 20 of them in a, in a parallel string. And the the issue is is that they're 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 expensive. The 24 volt uh, units are about $900 a kilowatt hour, uh, basically about 90 cents a watt, or about yeah, that works about three, right? So yeah, about 90 cents a watt. Um, and the 48 volt modules um, are actually a little bit lower. They're about $800 a kilowatt hour. Um, they are fully in integrated, which means you can take 10 of them and stack them in parallel. And as long as it's a closed loop communication, you won't have to go back through and balance those, those, those cells you know, every six to 12 months. Um, if you have, and, what, and the reason for that is, is that if there's a closed loop communication, the inverters control 
I'm sorry, the batteries control the inverters. Like for example, let's say you had an Outback Radian or a Schneider XW or an SMA or a Victron inverter. Um, and it's coming for the midnight stuff. It's not quite there yet. Um, but those five units, including the Studer, uh, but there's not a lot of Studer stuff in North America. Um, those five units, you hook the, the system up and you, 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 you hook the link card up you plug the, the remote into the, like for example, you plug uh, the, uh, the, the connect card to the Mate 3 or you plug it into the Schneider XW. And what'll happen is, is that when the battery needs a charge, it will send a, a message to the inverter or the charge controller saying, I need to be properly charged, okay? And so it'll start charging and when it's done charging, it'll shut the inverter off. It has, the battery will have complete control over the system. That's closed loop communication. On the open loop communication, how it works is, is do you have to program the inverter? It's just like dealing with lead acid battery. You have to program the inverter for charge. And if you're not right, you could have, you could have issues, but they won't be as big with lead acid batteries um, because lithiums can take the deficit cycling issues uh, much better than a, than a flooded lead acid battery. So, um, you know, so Rico, the, the biggest answer for, for you is, is going to be cost. Um, if you're going to put in, like, for example, those S530s, um, I'm guessing they lasted between, you know, five and 10, maybe 12 years. Uh, I've got a set of S460s that have been on my garage for 17 years because it's my third battery bank. And the first two battery banks, uh, the first two battery banks, I um, kill relatively quickly. Um, so, um, 90 cents a watt versus lead acid is about 35 cents a watt. So it's about two and a half to three times. So lithium is about two and a half to three times. So let's say you had eight. Uh, Rico, let me know how many batteries you had. Did you have eight S530s at 24 volts or 48 volts? Uh, I can give you an idea what batteries, battery bank size you need and what the cost is going to be. So eight at 24. So you had eight batteries at 24. So you had an 800 amp hour battery bank. Okay. So you would need four of the uh, four of the 24 volt modules to make that work. Now those 24 volt modules are going to run you about $3,200 US. So that battery bank is going to cost you right around $13,000 US for those for the equivalent battery bank and the equivalent size. You go back and you look. Um, even taking the depth of discharge and and this and 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 the, even taking the the depth of discharge into account, so you have an 800 amp hour battery bank versus a 400 amp hour lithium battery bank. 400 amp hours of lithium batteries is going to cost you right around thirteen thousand dollars. For or 800 amp hours of flooded lead acid batteries is going to cost you ballpark around thirty two to thirty thirty two to four thousand dollars. So um, it's very, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. If you go out and you, a lot of people don't have the disposable funds to spend 13, you know, 12, $13,000 on a battery bank versus spending three or $4,000 on a battery bank twice. Uh, so, um, so you have to really look at that. Um, so, uh, hi, Steve, this is uh, from uh, Julian. Um, Hi, Steve. What should I expect to see with newly installed flooded lead acid batteries in terms of capacity? Is there a break in period? Yes, there is. Um, if you're going to use a lower charging voltages, those break in periods can extend uh, in the, you know, in, into the uh, four to six month range. Um, on a, uh, if you're going to use our suggested charging set points that are in our manuals, typically the high end, if you're going to use the regularly cycling set points, the break-in periods for those are going to be about 10 to 15 cycles, so approximately about two to three weeks um, for a well-designed system. If you're doing if you're doing 10 to 15 cycles in 10 to 15 days, uh, you're probably going to be overcycling that battery bank, and you're probably going to be shortening the overall life of the battery bank. Most people, when they're doing uh, installations, uh, when they're doing uh, designs they'll design for a 25% depth of discharge and then they'll size the PV array large enough to handle the entire battery bank. So uh, if you're gonna put in a, say a 900 amp hour battery bank, 
um, that means that you're consuming less than you know a couple hundred amps a day. Basically, you're consuming less than 10 kilowatt hours per day. Um, but then they'll also put in, you know, let's assume this is 48 volts. At 48 volts, you're looking at roughly around to seven to a 10 kilowatt solar array to keep those battery banks fully charged. Um, and if you don't, what ends up happening is those those battery banks will suffer, and that 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 will cause the batteries to last last a shorter period of time. Um, so hopefully, Julian, that answers your question. Uh, looks like we've had one person drop out. Um, I don't have any other questions out there unless anybody else is going to ask more questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. And once another question pops up, I'll go ahead and uh, and 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 uh, and take care of that. So hopefully everybody's got uh, answers that they're looking for. Um, so on battery watering, especially flooded lead acid batteries, um, water is not created equally. Okay. So uh, here's a list of a bunch of waters out there that that a lot of customers, a lot of people will use. Um, distilled water, bottle drinking water, um, uh, deionized water, and I already talked about some of this, deionized water, verse osmosis water, rain water, water collected from an air conditioner. That's one of my favorite. You get that a lot in the Caribbean and Africa where they'll take the water, the, a bucket, and sit under the air conditioner, let the water drip into it, and then they'll use that and put that into the, the batteries. Um, uh, lake water, river water. So here's the answers to those questions. Um, and so as soon as I figure out what I'm doing here, there we go. Um, so here's the answer to those questions. Distilled water is a definite yes. You can use distilled water all you want, you know, whenever you want, no problem. The one thing I do suggest that you do is that you change or that you check your distilled water. And what that means is, is you, you check that distilled water with a TDS meter. It's called, that's T. Yeah, so it's called a TDS meter. And so um, you check it, it's TDS, and that stands for total dissolved solids. Pardon my chicken scratch, by the way. Uh, so that stands for total dissolved solids. And so, I've actually checked some distilled water uh, and and seen TDS uh, TDS numbers in the four or five hundred, all the way up to the thousand parts per million. So um, you you want to check it when you use it. Check it periodically to make sure that your the company isn't isn't shorting you. Um, bottle drinking water that is a big giant no. Do not use bottle drinking water. If you do, you are going to be shortening the life of the battery bank. Um, yes, you can use deionized water and reverse osmosis water. The problem is, is that again, you have to test them because if you're forcing the water through the filters too fast, what's going to happen is, is you're going to have a higher TDS content. You're going to be introducing metals and minerals into those batteries, and that's going to cause a shortened life of the battery. Don't ever, do not ever use rainwater, lake water, or water collected from an air conditioner. Don't do it, because if you do, you are going to be damaging and shortening life of your batteries. You're going to be killing them, and we can tell, and I'm going to show you pictures of what that looks like in a sec. We can tell what those look like when you do that, so definitely something not to do. Um, oops, maybe I should delete this. There we go. So, um, so. This is corrosion. This is a, unfortunately a pretty common thing to see in a battery bank when you go to it. Um, what causes this corrosion? And again, I said earlier, three things that causes corrosion like this. One's overfilling, two is improper ventilation, three is poor or loose connections, okay? When you fill a battery, this is the water level right here. This is our water level, okay? That water level should be below the bottom of the fill tube by six to, thir six to 13 millimeters or a quarter inch to a half an inch. A lot of people, there's a little notch in the, in the battery tube. A lot of people, and you know me included, I was taught when I bought my first 67 Ford Ranchero, the battery I had to put acid in it 
or electrolyte in it that had a notch and they told you to fill it to the notch. The problem is, is if you do that with a solar battery, what will happen is, is that will force the water out of the battery and onto the top of the battery. The best way to tell if this is what somebody's doing is you take your voltmeter, you have your, your battery, you have your positive and you have your negative. You put your negative probe on the negative and you put the positive probe anywhere on the top of the battery. So let's say this is the vent well, it's a two volt cell. If you do that and you see voltage, that means your customer or you have been overfilling your batteries and spilling your sulfate out of your batteries and you effectively reduce the capacity of your battery bank. Do not do that. If you do that, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose life and capacity of the batteries. Again, the system that I went to three weeks ago, they had 96 2KS33 batteries. These batteries cost them $80,000 five years ago and they trashed every one of them because they had been overfilling them for five years and the specific gravities they couldn't get above 1.1.210. 1 they could not, no matter what you did, you could equalize them for days and they wouldn't get above that. And it's because all that sulfate was populated on the top of the battery versus uh, versus on the uh, uh, versus in the batteries. Uh, back to lithium. So we're going to pause here real quick. Back to lithium. Um, can you mix and match by by what I mean? Can you add a new 24 volt LiPo bank to an existing lead acid bank? No, that is a big not to do because if you do that, um, what's going to happen is is that the the lithium iron phosphate battery has to have 100% control over the charging and it doesn't know what the lead acid battery is doing because there's no BMS attached to it and you don't want to go spend thousands of dollars to put a BMS on it. And so what you what, what by doing that what's going to what, what's going to happen is it you're going to cause problems with your lithium bank and you're going to cause problems with your lead bank. Um, even with even with lead acid batteries, you do not want to you do not want to add, uh, like for example, let's say we've got a set of S550s or a, that we call them S6L16HCs now. Um, if you have a set of those, say they're a year old and your customer or you want more capacity. Um, if you add a string to it, another string, another parallel string, what that's gonna do is that will increase your capacity, but the new batteries will sulfate to the level of the old batteries within the first six months. And you may have balancing problems where you'll have to separate the strings and do and charge the batteries periodically, charge each string independently periodically to keep them balanced. Um, when the old set, when the first set fails, you have to replace the entire battery bank. Don't just replace the dead batteries and, re, and keep going because that's just going to continue to exaggerate, exaggerate problems. Um, I actually, we actually had a customer who was buying uh, different, and you, you can't mix batteries either. You can't mix, you shouldn't be mixing uh, 2KS32 33s with 2YS31s or uh, 6CS17s, or you can't mix those because what happens is, is the battery becomes the lowest common denominator. So if you have a, if you mix a 800 amp hour battery with a thousand amp hour battery, the entire battery bank actually becomes closer to about a 650 to 700 amp hour battery because of the impedances and because of the, the Ohm's law calculations. So something to be cautious with. Sorry about that, I didn't mute my phone. So I'm sure you heard my cell phone going off. Someone's calling me, asking me for tech support. Anyways, um, back to here. This is, when we're, when we're talking about battery filling, this is actually a battery that we swapped out a couple of years ago. Uh, the customer, you know, we talked to the customer, we told him that he ran him dry, he swore up and down, he was a police officer, He there's no way he would cheat somebody like that, he didn't run him dry, no way. Well, unfortunately, when we got the battery back, you see this line right here, oops, as I, when we got the batteries back, um, I don't know why I'm having all kinds of problems today. You see this line right here, right there, this line right here, this line right here, okay? All those batteries, every one of these, all those cells, this is what it looks like when you run the batteries dry, okay? So when we get the batteries back, 
or if I go to the site and I do an autopsy on the batteries, basically what it is, it's literally, you can see this right here, it's literally cutting the top off the battery, pulling the plates out and inspecting the plates, okay? And so what you have here is you, on the top of the battery, this, this top portion, that's all what we call corrosion. And that corrosion is caused by oxidation. It's caused by the exposure of, of air to the plates. And what that does is it starts to corrode the battery. And usually three, four, five, six months later, what ends up happening is you end up losing all this capacity, gone forever. There's nothing you can do about it. And so now this becomes your new battery. And so now your, your plate that was a, say a 400 and, 45 amp hour battery now because you're only using half the plate now becomes a 200 to see a 220 amp hour battery okay so um this is what it looks like when you run them dry this right here is what it looks like when you use bad water okay and so that's corrosion that's the that's the the minerals that's 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 coming out of the water that's that's that mean you're introducing your battery that's causing entire plate corrosion. You can see it throughout the entire plate. This right here is what a good plate looks like. This is a 12 year old plate in a system that was properly installed, properly chested, properly charged. Um, no corrosion. You see a little bit of sulfation issues. Uh, you see a little bit. You know, there's a little bit of of, of, of wear on the battery where you see material coming off that's to be expected material is going to come off and so what happens is is that that's what happens internally in the battery and what causes the overall failure okay so we don't have any more questions so i'm going to keep going the next thing i'm going to talk about is determining charge system settings uh this is actually a three-part webinar or, se or sections of a three-part webinar that we did um a couple months ago um and basically what it is 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 um is how you set because this is probably 95 percent of our phone calls someone buys a battery someone buys a system uh we do they give us a call we we troubleshoot or they give us a call and they say yeah i bought these batteries six months ago they don't seem to be holding a charge anymore and the installer left everything at default settings um it's it's a problem and it's a, a lot of installers so if you're an installer if you leave the inverters at default settings you're going to cause all kinds of problems with your system if you're a homeowner if you're not actively looking at those settings periodically um at least once or two three times a year um you're you're complacent in it because you're not you're not properly maintaining your system because my system is a grid tie or a grid connected system that's made for backup it's got a little array on it and I have to still adjust my solar charge controller settings twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And typically in the spring, because I have less usage and I have more sun, I'm backing off my settings. And in the fall, because I have less solar, uh, you know, I have to I have to get a little, a little more aggressive with my settings of my solar uh, and time to make sure that I'm not using as much utility to charge the batteries. So. Um, so remember, solar controller settings. Solar is your free energy. Try to maximize what your solar consumption, what your solar is producing, okay? Believe it or not, weather matters. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we had lots of fires. I live in uh, Western Washington. Uh, we had lots of fires in BC and Alberta and fires in Oregon, fires in Eastern Washington, Idaho and California. It was, the, the sky was 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 basically, smoke for weeks in the summer um you know what should have been a good summer was was a bad summer because of how how bad the the, the smoke was so um i went out with my my insulation meter my solar meter to check how much actually insulation i was getting uh normally i'd get around 700 800 watts per meter squared of insulation um and and during those times you're lucky to get 200 and so your thousand watt array may only be performing it, you know, 150, 200 watts of power. So you've got to be, you've got to be cautious with that. Um, seasons matter. Um, typically in the summer, your settings are going to be a little lower. In the winter, they're going to be a little longer. Cabling matters. Um, you know, if you put in an 80 amp charge controller and you've got, you know, 4,500 watts of solar uh, on that, you're going to need to make sure that cabling uh, is properly tightened. Need to make sure it's properly maintained, which means if you cabling does go bad, 
Um, uh, especially if the installer or, or, or it's a DYI system where you didn't use the correct cable, uh, it does go bad. So uh, remember with a tracking array, you're gonna get zero to eight hours of good sun. Stationary array, it's gonna be zero to 5.5 hours. Okay, it's not, you know, just because you live in the Bahamas doesn't mean you get 12 hours of good sun because the 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 solar the the, the sun tracks across the sky and it doesn't it the the panels that the panels are stationary you get three and a half to four hours of, of decent sun a day sometimes five uh, sometimes less so you've got to be cautious with that settings that matter bulk and absorption voltage absorption timers end amps battery amp hour settings battery temperature compensation flow voltage and equalized voltage and time and this is in an order of importance okay so those are the settings that really matter for us notice that i did not put the rebulk or refloat settings rebulk and refloat um rebulk and refloat are inverter controlled setting for a grid connected system uh battery manufacturers don't really it does, it's not something that really that really that we really care about Okay, uh, I got a question, so I'm gonna pause real quick. Um, another question from Rico. Uh, I just put my, ba my bank back into service, but two of the cells do not seem to be taking a charge based on the specific gravity. What should I expect from this bank? Uh, is, is a failure imminent? Um, yes and no. You, there's not a lot of information there. Uh, the question I would have is what, what does not taking a charge mean? Uh, what are the specific gravities? If your specific gravities say are the rest of the batteries are in the 1260s and 1270s and you've got them in the 1240s and 1250s, um, they are taking a charge. Um, you may have a poor connection. You may have a high impedance cell. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. Now, if those specific gravities are in the low 1210s, 1220s or lower than that, um, then yeah, they aren't taking a charge and you may have cells that are on the brink of failure. Um, so, um, what I would suggest that you do, Rico, is you send me uh, an email at steve at .com, Um, and um, uh, you send me an email to steve at and I'll give you the email real quick. With the troubleshooting form, um, and uh, let's see here. Let me... Uh, can never, hopefully everybody can see the handouts. Um, the handouts that we already have in the system are the, uh, uh, the, the handouts in the system are the, the user manual and the user manual is a specific gravity form. But let me go ahead and attach, I will attach the troubleshooting form uh, as well. That way you can fill that out and send it to me and I can help you out. Um, the reason I'm attaching the troubleshooting form is because that has all the questions. Uh, that holds all the questions that we would need so we don't have to play 20 questions over email and get your problem taken care of as, as, as soon as possible. So if you go to the handout section uh, on your control panel, you should be able to download the manual and that, for, and, and that, that troubleshooting form. Okay, excellent. So, um, there we go. Good. That works. How about that? Something that works in today's world. It's great. So, bulk and absorption voltages. Um, for the solar controllers, typically the absorption voltages are the same. Uh, like, for example, if you have a Schneider MPPT60, it's going to ask you bulk and absorption voltage. If you have an Outback, it's just going to ask you absorption voltage. If you have the PT100, it's dip switch settings. Um, so depending on if it's if it's a Morningstar controller, you know it's going to have you know typically dip switches, or you're going to program it separately. For our batteries, all of our flooded lead acid batteries, bulk and absorption voltages is 2.4 to 2.2.45 to 2.5 volts per cell. So that's 58.8 to 60 volts. Um, I will typically shade closer to the 60 volt range on the 48 volt system. Again, that's that's 15 volts for 12 volts, 30 volts for 24 volts, 60 volts for 48 volts. I will shade to the high end of that. And the reason for that is, is because I wanna maximize how much power I'm getting from my solar, okay? So if I've got a, 
you know, say I've got a 900 amp hour or 890 amp hour battery bank, you know, you know, and I've got a four kilowatt solar, four kilowatt of solar at 48 volts. That means that I'm going to charge about 75 amps peak. Okay. Realistically, that's going to be about 60 to 65 amps under normal conditions, which means that's going to, that's going to slow down my overall charge rate. And so what you need to be cautious of is that you need to have enough solar to reasonable state of charge. And so if your customer is in this situation, what's going to happen is, is for about four to five months of the year, they're going to, it's going to be great for them because they've got, you know, the, the, the summer window, you know, but the other, you know, there's another two or three months where it's going to be borderline poor. And then you've got another four months of the year where it's going to be flat out poor and they're going to be running their generator constantly. So when you're doing these solar installations, you need to make sure that your solar array is sized to be able to charge the battery bank. And if it's not, what's gonna happen is the battery bank's gonna sit in a sulfated state and you're gonna have problems. Uh, so you wanna try to avoid that. If you have wind or hydro, that's a little different. Uh, wind and hydro, typically what you're doing with wind and hydro is it's you're forcing voltage into the batteries and then there's a dump load to take the voltage away when the batteries get too high. Um, I'm going to go a little bit lower, 2.45 to 2.48, and the reason is, is that I don't want to overcharge my batteries too much. I don't want to pull, push too much into it, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to 2.48 and set my diversion load to do, say, 59.6 to 59.8. So when the battery voltage gets to that high level, that's when I'm going to I'm turn on my diversion loads to shut off my charge, to slow down my charge so I'm not damaging the batteries. Um, the inverter charger settings, this is not a free energy because when you're charging with your inverter chargers, you're using a generator. And so to minimize generator runtime, uh, you have to be cautious of that. Altitude affects generators for about every thousand feet or 330 meters, you're gonna lose between seven and 10% of your generator capacity just because of the reduction in oxygen that's, 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 that, that, the generator needs to burn the fuel. And so fuel doesn't burn when there's less oxygen. So if you're at 6,000 feet, you could see 40, 50, 60% losses on that 15 kW generator. So now it's a seven to 10 kW generator instead of a 15 kW generator. So if you don't account for that installers, you're gonna have problems. Ah, oh, there seems to be another question real quick. So we'll, we'll, ask that, we'll answer that one real quick. Uh, can you go bigger than 20% of the C20 rate for charge rate? That's a really good question. Um, on flooded lead acid batteries, that's a big fat no. And the reason is, is that when you go over 20%, the batteries have an internal resistance and then internal resistance, when you start pushing a lot of current into the battery, what will happen is, is that'll actually cause the positive post of the battery to start rising out of the battery. It's called plate expansion. It causes positive post plate expansion. Um, not to mention it's, it cause lot, causes lots of additional gassing and can cause uh, that gassing to ignite. And once that back gas ignites, um, it's, uh, it's all over but the cryon. Um, now AGM batteries and uh, gel batteries, they will accept up to 30% of that C20 rate. Um, so if you have a thousand amp hour AGM or gel, they'll accept up to 300 amps of current. Um, it's, it's not always advisable to go that high. Uh, on flooded lead acid batteries, we suggest 15% as the optimum. Uh, so you have a thousand amp hour battery bank, we suggest you have a 150 amp hour charger. Um, on a thousand amp hour battery bank of AGMs or gels, we suggest a 200 amp charger, um, 200 amps worth of charging from a single charge source. Um, and the reason for that is the, to minimize the absorption time and to make sure that you get the batteries to a full state of charge. Now, when it comes to lithium batteries, lithium batteries can charge and discharge at the C1 rate all the time. So let's say you put in three parallel strings of, uh, of our S486650, which is equivalent to roughly a 390 amp hour battery. You could technically put 390 amps of current of that battery. But what's gonna happen is, is instead of an hour to charge it, it's gonna take about an hour and a half to two hours to get it fully charged. It's not something that you want to do all the time, 
uh, because what, what ends up happening is the, the faster you charge, uh, the less acceptance you get, and it actually makes the battery a little bit smaller capacity. It's a, it's a, it's called Pukert's Devon or Pukert's theory. Um, so it's just something you got to be careful of. So generally on lithium, on our lithium batteries, we suggest you know if you've got a 390 amp hour battery bank, if you're putting 150, 200 amps of current into it, your charge time is going to be about two, two and a half hours to get to a full 100 percent charge. Um, uh, Anything more than that's really kind of wasteful. You're just going to lower the capacity of the battery and it's not going to be perfect for you. Um, all right, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, if, it, if, I, if, if, you, if you want me to follow up, let me know. I'd be more than happy to follow up and or, or send me an email. Again, my email address is steve at I'd be more than happy to try to help you out. Um, uh, on the inverter charger settings, again, the same settings that matter. Oops. Uh, same settings, again, in the order that they matter of. So be cautious of that. Um, you know, if you're not programming those settings or you've got a system and you haven't programmed all those settings, then that might be why something's going on. Um, uh, other settings to watch out, battery efficiency or battery charge factor. This is typically um, settings for like uh, the Outback FlexNet DC or battery meters. You need to make sure those are set correctly. Um, typically for flooded lead acid batteries, that's 80%. For, uh, uh, so FLAs and, or, or basically lead. Um, for LFP, lithium iron phosphate, um, those settings are 92 to 95%. Um, again, low battery cutout, typically low, typically low battery cutout um, is set to <laughs> it comes defaulted at uh, typically, oops, sorry, 1.75 volts per cell, which is uh, 10, 5, 21, or 42 volts. You don't want that. Typically, you want that to be roughly about 1.8 volts per cell to 1.85 volts per cell. Um, if you set them too low, you have a possibility of over discharging your battery. Generator start and stop. Um, again, generator start and stops. Uh, those are based on how your customer is using them. And your generator start voltages, typically 47.6, 47.2. Uh, generator stop voltages. Uh, you need to complete the absorption time. So don't stop it based on voltage. Stop it when the absorption time completes. Because if you don't, those batteries are going to start to sulfate and you're going to have a problem. Uh, Rebulk and refloat. Again, that is an inverter-based setting. That setting is specifically for grid-connected systems, okay? And what it means is, is that when the charge is done, it goes into what's called silent mode. When it goes into silent mode, the voltage drops because it's not charging the battery. When the voltage gets to the rebulk or the refloat setting, it does another bulk cycle or another float cycle. And so if you're completely off-grid and you're using a generator, you're not letting your generator run for 10, 12 hours unless you initially have to. So rebulk and refloat settings, we don't care about. Nobody cares about. It's it, it, again, it's it's it goes back to when I do my installer trainings. I tell my installers they have to learn the product that they're installing, because if they don't, um, these things are going to come back and bite them up. And lastly, that's very important is site follow up, especially for you installers. For you guys that are installing these systems, if you're not doing site follow up, you're you're, you're, you're shortening the life of the battery bank. You need to follow up with that client, follow up with that customer and make sure that they are checking their specific gravities and make sure that they are taking care of their maintenance. If they're not, then you sell them a maintenance plan. Uh, typical maintenance plan, you're looking at between 250 to $500, depending on the site location and the site, the cells, uh, for, you know, for probably three to five hours on site to do maintenance. Um, just to give you an idea, um, Three weeks ago, I was at that system, or four weeks ago, I was at that system in the Bahamas with 96 cells. Um, I was able to check specific gravities on all 96 cells in less than uh, 90 minutes um, because I'm used to checking specific gravities. I'm fast at checking specific gravities because I've been doing it for 25 years. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it, the, the, the more you're going to feel, uh, the more comfortable you're going to feel about it. Um, all right, so um, 
I don't have any more questions here. Uh, I, I just, I've just kind of gone over some of my filler material to make sure that uh, uh, at least we're talking about something. Um, again, if you have further questions or uh, guarantee as soon as we hang up from each other, what will happen is, is you'll, you'll forget to ask a question. Uh, we might start doing these if you want once a week, once every couple of weeks. Um, we had a few people here. We had some good questions today. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, I'm guessing that most of us are all stuck in the house uh, and stay at home orders or stay at home requests, I guess you could say. Um, but uh, uh, but definitely thank you for coming and listening and listening to me ramble for the last 60 minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the uh, my email page. Oops. So I will go back to my email page. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to give me a call. Feel free to email me, and I'll be more than happy to, to answer your questions. Uh, if you want to call directly, uh, the 902 number, my direct extension, 902-597-4020. Uh, Oops. 902-597-4020. And I'm still having all kinds of technical difficulties today for some reason. Um, my mobile number, if you want to call my mobile number, and then of course my email address if you have questions via email. Um, again, thank you very much, and you guys have a great day. Hopefully, you stay safe and stay out of trouble. <laughs>